Hello, good evening and a very warm welcome. My name is Richard Blanco and I'm chair of the Redbridge Landlords Forum. Very warm welcome to this evening's forum. Um, we're expecting a really high turnout tonight, so it's great to, to have you all with us. I'm also the London representative for the National Residential Landlords Association. And I'm just, first of all, I'm going to uh, remind you that uh, this evening's meeting is being recorded. Um, so uh, um, just be aware of that. Also, everybody is muted at the moment. Um, now, if you'd like to ask a question, you can ask a question in the chat facility um, or you could uh, raise your hand and we might at some point in the meeting be able to unmute you and get you to ask your question live. Uh, and um, there will be a recording of the meeting available, of course, at the end, if you want to kind of look through the slides or watch watch the meeting again. Um, I'll just uh, show you what we're up to this evening. So uh, here is a look. Whoops, just trying to move my slides. And I seem to be struggling with that. There we go. Whoops. Richard, there we go. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So this is tonight. Richard, we, Sorry, Richard, you have the wrong just screen. Just see sharing. your explorer view. Yeah. Oh, I see. Right. We seem to have a problem with the slides. OK, let me just try that again. My apologies. Just trying to share slides for you now. Uh, just checking, can someone well, tell me if you can see no, the slides? No, we can see your email, Richard. OK, so there's a technical issue and it doesn't seem that you're going to be able to see my slides. It's just one second. Let me. Have a look. Uh, you can't yes. see them now. Yes, we can. We you can. can. Great. We I'm can. sorry about that, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I was just going to take you through tonight's agenda. So um, we're running until 9 p.m. tonight. We're going to start off with a, select, a selective licensing update and um, we'll get four brief presentations, one from Misha and Nick uh, and also from Adam, who is a research and evaluation director at Mel Research. Uh, and we'll also be hearing from Cheryl and Shamal, who are all from the um, licensing teams at London Borough of Redbridge. Um, I will then be presenting um, on life after Section 21. So my talk will be about the Renters Reform Bill um, and uh, the changing landscape that we can expect landlording to become um, once Section 21 has been abolished. That will then be followed by um, a presentation from Peter van der Venning. He's director of the Mortgage Consultancy and he'll be talking to you about rising interest rates and how the mortgage market has been shifting over the last few weeks and what to expect if you're one of two million people who are coming off fixed rates um, over the next year. So that's what we're up to this evening. And what I think we'll do um, without further ado is move straight into our licensing presentation. So I will hand over to Misha Kular and also Nick uh, Austin, who are going to start off the presentation. So good evening, Misha and Nick. Hi, good evening, everyone. Let me just share my screen. So as Richard introduced me, my name's Misha Kuller. I'm a project manager in the private sector housing team at Redbridge. And my colleague, Nick Austin, is the head of consumer protection and licensing. So I wanted to give you an update on the selective licensing renewal consultation. The consultation launched on the 1st of November um, and Adam will tell you more about that, but it will it's scheduled to run for around 13 weeks to the end of January 23. This um, followed cabinet approval on the 19th of October. Um, and the map on the right there shows um, the proposed wards to be included in any new scheme stroke scheme. So there's 18 wards. Um, that have been identified. Four wards have not been included and they are Bridge, Clay Hall, Fulwell and Munkhams. So following the consultation, what will happen is that a final report incorporating all the feedback um, that we receive 
will then go back to cabinet um, and they will um, obviously make a decision on, on what the final um, scheme would look like. Um, anything over than 20% would need an application to the to DLUC, the Department for Leveling Up and Housing and Communities. Um, so it could be that we go either for no selective licensing or we look to replicate uh, kind of the existing format, a, a smaller scheme one initially, and then potentially moving to a scheme two. But obviously that remains to be seen um, and everything is up for discussion at the moment. So just to just to make it clearer, so you can see two maps on the screen there. The one on the left, the existing selective licensing schemes, this shows the model that we're currently operating. You can see the light blue scheme one and the pink areas are scheme two. Um, they were based on the pre 2000, I want to say 18, 19 boundary changes. Um, the map on the right are the new proposed wards to be included. Um, and you can see that Hainault has come, come into the proposals. All of Fairlop, Barkingside, Wanstead Park, and Wanstead, the whole of Wanstead Village, some was missing there in the pre-boundary ward changes. So the, the council has appointed a consultation specialist um, and that is Mel Research. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Adam Knight Markegi, who's the director at Mel, who will be overseeing all the activities. And he's going to tell you all about how you can get involved and give us your feedback. So I shall stop sharing. And over to you, Adam. That's great, lovely. Thanks very much for that. Um, and I've got my own slides. We've got lots of slides between us here, so uh, but not too too many for me. Uh, so great and great to have this opportunity to speak to to so many people today. Actually, just a few days after the launch of the consultation, uh, just launching the first of November on Tuesday. So it's so a great, really, to kind of share that with you, kind of already uh, at this stage in the consultation. Um, so as Misha said, uh, I'm kind of I'm speaking from MER Research. Uh, we are an independent agency and hosting the consultation. Um, so um, we're not based in uh, kind of Redbridge. And for us, really, our role is to kind of gather feedback about the uh, proposals to see what people think. That will be from landlords, from agents, from residents, tenants and beyond. Um, and to kind of objectively kind of respond, kind of represent those really back to the council. And it's for the council to decide how they want to go ahead. So we're really hoping to hear from people in lots of different ways. Uh, and as Misha said, it kind of started this week and it runs all the way through to the end of January. So, uh, you know, quite a good spell of time uh, for people to respond. Uh, there's different ways to do that. And I'll just go on to that in a sec. Um, and we do want to hear from a good cross section of people. So landlords like yourselves, but yeah, agents, tenants uh, and, and others. Um, and really, we want to hear about the kind of views of licensing, the renewal, the proposed renewal of licensing, what the impact may be. So it may be on you, that may be on your neighbourhood, that may be on Redbridge more widely. Also kind of questions about the fees, about the conditions, and there's opportunities to kind of share really more wide views about how you think it may be running already and any kind of considerations or alternatives that the council could consider instead of or alongside any selective licensing that may carry on. Adam, we've just had a had a request. Well, please, would you speak a little louder? Uh, sure, I can do that. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, and there's um, lots of different opportunities to have your say. So um, there's there's a whole host of documents, kind of background documents, kind of maps that we've kind of shown you, uh, that Misha's shown you there. There's the survey, there's frequently asked questions, and there's an evidence base, which gives the rationale for introducing a, uh, kind of renewing the selective licensing schemes, the schemes. You can find all of those on the website. So that's, um, you know, the best link there is redbridge.gov.uk slash licensing consultation. 
So if you follow that link and then look at the selected licensing, um, I've got a screenshot of that in a second. Uh, there you'll also find an online survey. Alongside that, we're doing a representative survey of residents across Redbridge. So again, that's a, a wide way to hear from people, to hear from residents about their views on the proposals. Uh, we're also having a number of focused discussions. So it's good to kind of kind of present to launch this uh, to you today, but actually it'd be really good to hear feedback from landlords. And so one of the sessions that we're hosting will be specifically with landlords and, and it's the invite now to kind of come along to join that. We do want to kind of pre-register you, um, but that will be on Thursday, the 24th of November. So in three weeks time uh, between seven and 8.30. Again, we'll do that kind of virtually uh, so people can kind of access that way. Um, there are other ways, uh, non-virtual for people to get a comment. Uh, but if you do want to come along to that, you're kind of interested to have a say, uh, really have a discussion about what that might mean for you uh, and to make your points, um, you know, put your points across, do let us know. So we're happy to have your kind of details, contact details in the chat today or to kind of email us. And the email is there at the bottom of the screen. So we've got a dedicated email address, which we're happy to receive comments and contributions to the consultation to. Uh, so the email is redbridgeprs at merresearch.co.uk. Uh, I'm sure we can put that into the chat as well as we as we go. Yep, just uh, do so it we're now. doing that. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've got the focus discussions. We've also got interviews with a you know a wider selection of stakeholders. They may be neighbouring boroughs, uh, the statutory organisations, poss possibly the likes of the NRLA uh, or housing advice agencies as well. So so again, trying to get a good cross section of discussion and views. Um, just then to reiterate, um, here is the website again where you can find out. Uh, all the information. You can have uh, a much more detailed read about the proposals and you can have your say. So on the right hand side of the screen is just the, you know, the, the, the front screen of the consultation page itself. So really just encouraging you to uh, have your say, you know, whatever views you may have uh, to help, uh, you know, uh, for us to kind of help um, kind of the council make a decision on whether they go ahead with the uh, renewal of the licensing schemes. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Adam. Um, I'm just looking in the chat and we haven't had any questions so far, so I'll just pause for a moment. Has anybody got a question they'd like to ask? Just brief questions on the consultation um, and the process. I think, you know, that was all very clear. Thanks, Misha and Adam. So we've got a consultation process going on now for a few weeks and now's the time to either go along to that meeting um, that Adam's organising or um, or to um, to uh, take part in the consultation process that Misha outlined. Um, uh, what's happening with the slides, Misha? Do we put them up on the um, website or what do we do with them? Or do people just yeah. re-watch the recording? The recording goes on the website, so hopefully that will be OK for you all. Um, but you should yes. be able to kind of fast forward or rewind or pause on on any of the slides that you um, that you want to look back on. Yes, yeah, so just uh, to be clear, yeah. we don't send slides out because that's obviously quite difficult administratively. So the, the recording of the webinar will be on the website and you can just go through stop and start through the recording to look at the slides um, at, um, at your own pace. OK, well, um, let's move on Wait, to I'm... our next. Presentation. Sorry, Rick. Sorry, Nick. Yes. You want Sorry, to Richard. In? What I would say is anything that you've seen in those slides, if you follow the link to the consultation uh, at the bottom are all the documents, the maps and the plans and everything is there. So it's all freely available. So the best way to find find that if you want to look in detail is to uh, just click on that link and yeah. look at the documents at the bottom. And can I just say, please, please, please sign up for that session because it is a really good opportunity. Um, for you guys to have um you know your say um and really get down to the nitty gritty on it so just put your um email just say focus group and put your email in there and, and we will filter out your email addresses um and get back to you with details um and well forward you the invite to that meeting on the 24th of november it will be 7 till 9 p.m 
and um, same format as this but obviously there's a couple of questions Misha which I will answer so one of them is is the con a consultation on HMOs well selective licensing isn't HMOs it's just properties that are rented to related people and the new scheme the select new selective licensing scheme just relates to properties that are rented to families so there isn't a new scheme for HMOs at the moment and that's why there's no consultation on that um, there's another question here from Vinod that says, when you say we can have a say, what does that mean? I was told that it was all decided and it will go ahead irrespective of what anyone says. So just to be clear, in the 2004 Housing Act, if local authorities want to bring in selective licensing schemes, they must go through a consultation process. I think it's a minimum of 10 weeks or um, often it, it's slightly longer than that. But I think I'm, I'm right in saying it's it's 10 weeks. Um, and the council must uh, consult very widely, so not just people within the borough, but also people beyond the borough, because, of course, there will be landlords who have properties in the borough uh, that don't actually live there. So um, uh, it is true that actually, you know, the local authority doesn't have to do anything with the consultation. It can ignore what everybody says. But of course, you know, councillors are democratically elected and they should be taking account of what the public say in a consultation and you know all, all I would advise to you as landlords is put your views forward say what you think this is the moment to, to say what you think about licensing um, and, and this proposal uh, in this consultation and talk to your councillors you know email your councillors go to councillor surgeries tell them what you think of it and what you think should or shouldn't be in, included so this, this is the space to, to yeah. do that in Tell us, uh, come, come to the sessions, come to the session on the 24th. Yes. OK. Uh, right. Well, something. Vera asks if we are unhappy with the way the council runs the licensing scheme, which higher government body can we address it to? Well, I guess initially you would make a complaint to the council um, and then you would go on to the local government ombudsman. I don't know if um, anyone else wants to just chip in there and um, say what the complaints process would be if you, if somebody's unhappy with the way the council runs the scheme. Does that about cover it, Misha? I think. Yeah, I think yeah. so. OK, sure. Uh, all our complaints is on the website. You can just log on to the website and there's a complaints procedure there. Um, and this question from Farid about what if the current licensing, uh, selective licenses are expiring on the 31st of December 2022. There is a timing issue, isn't there here, um, with the expiry of some licenses and um, whether there's a gap. Can anyone answer that for us? So, Did, yeah, oh, sorry, go on. Oh, that's all right. So licenses remain in force until they expire. If you're on a scheme area that isn't receiving new applications, so obviously we fall back to the normal statutory duties under housing. But in some of those areas where the scheme has expired, if a license is a current and in date, the conditions and everything remain. OK, thank you. And uh, Vinod has chipped in again to say, um, I've not come across any landlord who agreed last time, but it still went ahead. I mean, it, uh, it's true, you know, Vinod, licensing is not popular among landlords. Something like 78, mm -hmm. 70 to 80 percent of landlords often say they don't want the scheme to go ahead. Um, I'm afraid local authorities have broad sweeping powers under the 2004 Housing Act that does give them powers to bring in licensing schemes. And it has become very popular in London. Um, and, um, you know, the only way to, to try and stop it, I guess, if you really don't want it to happen, is to use your votes you know, in, in elections and try and elect politicians who don't believe in licensing schemes. So it's, you know, it's one of those things that we're having to deal with uh, as landlords. Certainly the NRLA is opposed to broad schemes that cover most of the borough. And we do constantly talk to ministers and we're constantly lobbying government about licensing on landlords' behalf. And we're aware that licensing is unpopular. Um, Mandeep says, uh, does that mean we have to renew the licensing? Well, just to be clear about this, under the 2004 Act, selective licensing schemes can only last for five years. So all licenses under discretionary licensing, be this selective or additional, will expire after five years. And that's why you then have to reapply. So that's why um, licenses have to be renewed, I guess, or, or, or reapplied for, really. Um, this just, question just here... 
I was sorry, just going to say, sorry, Richard, you. just one yes. thing I was going to say as well. Even if um, we want to license 14 or 18 wards, we still have to apply and, and produce evidence base to go to the Secretary of State or Duluc now, and it can still be thrown out or reduced, which happened to us before five years ago. Because originally yes. we wanted borough wide and we ended up with 14 wards. So, you know, it's not our, it's not the Redbridge's sole decision. Yes, that's a good point, Cheryl. And in fact, that 20% limit was brought in because of NRLA campaigning, actually, in, in I think it was 2012. So that was one thing that we did manage to persuade ministers of. And it is a kind of check that's that's in there that, that I think yeah. a lot of people appreciate. Um, just other questions here. Why hasn't the four wards been included? And Amisha, presumably that is because there wasn't sufficient evidence to suggest yeah. that they met the threshold for selective licensing. Is that right? Yeah, you can read the evidence base, but essentially just looking at the size of the PRS in those areas. Um, help me out here, Nick. I think it was the size of the PRS um, in general that we, you know, the, the major factor in that recommendation, if I remember rightly. As, as Richard, as you said, there's criteria that lays, lays out clearly when you when you can or can't, uh, you know, there's a threshold to be met as to when you can introduce a scheme and the evidence on reviewing the evidence, the council did not find that related to those four wards. And that's something to do with the size of the housing stock. And then also relaying, relaying it back to the issues. What I would suggest is you look at the summary of the evidence base as it as it's laid out, but it clearly didn't pass the threshold for those four wards. Um, we should add actually that although uh, discretionary licensing is unpopular amongst landlords. It is popular amongst residents and typically in consultation, something like 70 percent of residents say that they do want it. So, um, you know, and uh, councils obviously have to try and take a balanced view of, of, of what their constituents are, are saying, I guess. We've got um, this question. Um, what's the difference? Uh, oh, sorry. Is the proposal still to ban more than two sharers? even for very large houses. Now, Peter uh, Peter Swatridge, I think what you're talking about there, Peter, is Article 4. So there is an Article 4 direction in Redbridge, which means that if you want to set up an HMO now, you do need planning permission. So that is separate from this, and that's a planning competency, not a licensing competency. So it's, it's a completely different department. It has nothing to do with licensing. Um, and, and you can read about that on the Redbridge web, website, or if you go to londonpropertylicensing.co.uk, that will explain what an Article 4 is and, and um, where it's in force. And um, the legislation around that is complex, so you, you need to do a bit of research, I think. Um, OK, I'm just having a quick look to see if there's any other... Yes, I mean, this uh, issue of Peter uh, that costs will be passed on to tenants, that's an argument, you know, the cost of the licence, landlords will just pass it on to tenants. That is an argument that is made by the NRLA and frequently brought up by by landlords. And it is a frustration that landlords feel that these are additional costs that will ultimately put, push up rents. So I think that's a point that's been made a lot and I'm sure um, will, will be heard in the consultation. Um, mentions of a discount. Does anyone know about that, Alan? Because some uh, Alan brings it up because some boroughs, for example, even Newham is now allowing discounts for accredited landlords. Are there any proposals for that, Misha? At the moment, in the consultation, I believe a flat fee has been put forward. But again, you know, that's something that we want to hear your views on, and and we can consider that. Um, it you know if it's put into the consultation feedback so please do tell us um, you know what sort of discounts you're looking for and, and what we can perhaps consider. Yes and I would recommend that you know as many landlords as possible in the consultation say that we you know, you think there should be a discount if you're accredited. Um, it's uh, this is Newham's third time now with selective and additional licensing. And I finally persuaded them to allow discounts for uh, accredited landlords. I think it's a discount of £50. So I, I would recommend that, um, you know, if you think that that's that's right and it should be like that, then do suggest that in the consultation. Please do, yeah. Yes, yeah. We've got lots of questions, but I think we should move on. And what we might do is come back to more questions at the end 
um, on, on licensing, because otherwise we'll end up having an entire landlord forum on licensing. <laughs> so what I'll do is uh, hand us over to Cheryl now, who's going to uh, okay. follow up, I think, on enforcement. Is that right, Cheryl? No, no, I'm the oh, licensing. Not yet. I'm the sorry. licensing manager. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, Shamal's, that's Shamal's baby. Oh, sorry, I'm getting you confused. <laughs> right, good morning. Good, good morning. Good evening, everybody. Um, nice to hear you and see you all again. Now, hopefully you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Anybody? Yes, no? Uh, yes, we yes, can, Cheryl, yes. You can? Right, okay. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I'm Cheryl, the Property Licensing Processing Manager. Um, and just literally a couple of quick messages, really. Um, as uh, Cheryl, we... just to interrupt, yeah. sorry, I think yeah. the view has gone a bit odd. We can see both slides. Is okay. it possible you put it on the view that is just the slide that you're talking about. Um, that's, we can see all three now. Um, we Hold can see- Let me try again. Okay, sure. Let's try again. Mm. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, no, okay. no, it does. They do that when I do presentations at events. If you press display settings, when you do it, it'll, if you go back into it, Hit that. Do your slideshow. Slideshow, yeah. It keeps, it, starts, on, it keeps on splitting the screen. See display then. settings just underneath the red border. Oh, Change, oh it's a, it's a that, bar. And then du um, duplicate swap, slideshow. I think, or or swap duplicate, present. Yeah. Swap presenter. There you go. Is that it? Is that all that's right? It. Yes, that's good now. Thank you very much. Oh, Brilliant. Well, you, thank God for that. <laughs> I'm glad somebody <laughs> knows what they're doing. Right. <laughs> so good morning. Good evening again. Morning. Good evening again. Um, so just a couple of quick messages about property licensing. Um, we are in the last year now of uh, Selective Scheme 2. Uh, Selective Scheme 2 is 12 designated wards or areas of Redbridge. Um, and since our additional small HMO licensing scheme um, has finished and is being reviewed, um, this means that contrary to some belief, if you have a small HMO in a selective scheme to ward, you still will need a selective scheme ward, uh, sorry, selective scheme license if um, it's not a mandatory, but it is a property being rented out in a selective scheme to ward. So I'll show you more information on that in a second. Very quickly, this is just to give you an idea, obviously, because we're towards the end of a five year um, licensing with uh, selectives, um, obviously the amount of applications coming in have reduced quite rapidly. Um, but you can see that in the month of September, um, we were actually getting more applications in um, than previous months. Um, basically, our focus now as a team, because with the licenses are slowing down, we are focusing now on um, cracking down on any unlicensed properties, especially in the Selective 2 scheme area. So just to reiterate, Selective Scheme 2 is 14 designated areas, which is these red areas of Redbridge. And so if you've got a small HMO or a single household in any of these areas, you will need a license. So the two schemes that we have got running until um, a new scheme comes in for selectives or an additional, and to, from between now and then, we've got the mandatories, obviously, which is a large HMO of five or more people forming two or more households, and that is borough-wide. So the whole of Redbridge is applicable to that. And if you've got a small HMO or a single household or a couple or a single person, if they are in the selective scheme two area, which is the red areas of this map, then they will need a license, even if it's a small HMO. And what we are doing with those um, properties, if it is a small HMO, um, when you put the fill out your application, it, it identifies it as a small HMO and it will have a visit if it's a small HMO, even though it's a selective license. So I just wanted to make it clear that people realise um, that we are cracking down and we are we we want to um, apply sanctions to anybody who's not got a license and basically to make the make it clear that it will not benefit anybody um, if they have been operating without a license because we will. Um, get them to license and there will be sanctions for them for not licensing. So that's the main message for the moment. That's it from me. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Cheryl. Um, we'll move straight on to Shamol then, I think. And you've got a, another brief presentation, haven't you, Shamol? Good, Shamol, good, good evening. Just get rid of mine. Am I sharing? Good evening, everyone. Yes, that's come through. Shamol, thank you. Okay. okay. Stop sharing. Slide show. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Shamol Ali, and I'm, a, I'm the Housing Standards Team Manager at Redbridge. I usually give you an update on the enforcement activity um, that's been going on the last couple of months. So I'll go straight to the first slide. Good. Sorry to interrupt, Jamal. Could you yes. just go um, click on from current slide? Because then it should, uh, the slide should come up bigger if you do that. Where are we? Where's that? Uh, so if you get, it goes from beginning, from current slide, right to the left. From that's current it. slide. Just there. Yeah, if you click on that. OK. There we go. That's perfect. Thank you. OK, excellent. OK, so this slide, uh, I won't go into much detail, but it, it just gives you a snapshot of the enforcement activity that's gone on in the last few months. Um, so it covers service requests, enforcement notices that have been served on non-compliant landlords. We've identified hazards and this graph shows the number of hazards that we've identified and remedied through our intervention and enforcement visit, visits made. Now you'll see some dips here and the explanation for those dips is that we've lost a few um, officers and we're recruiting at the moment to backfill. So that's the explanation for some of the dips. And at the bottom here, it just gives you some information on some civil penalties that we've, the civil penalties that we've um, issued recently. Okay, moving on to this slide. So as some, some of this will be repetition of um, what Cheryl's just told you. So um, we've the scheme one came to uh, an end earlier on in the year with a 97 percent compliance. And now it's the last year of scheme two. So we're focusing heavily on the unlicensed premises still out there. Um, our focus is to find those unlicensed um, premises and how we're going to find them is through um, an intelligence model um, that we've um, we've acquired, which has algorithms that give us information on um, predictability of where the unlicensed premises um, may be. It takes into account lots of different information where we also have uh, officers on the ground identifying um, unlicensed premises and we have other open data sources to find those premises. We also use a multi-agency task group um, with partners. So we have the Redbridge um, enforcement officers, housing enforcement officers working with the police and we actively um, search for unlicensed pro um, properties through those, um, through those uh, Redbridge action days. This is to create a level playing field because we know most landlords are good landlords, they're compliant landlords, and there are a handful of non-compliant landlords. We're here um, in the last year of licensing to actively go out and find those um, uh, unlicensed properties, and we will be taking action against those landlords. We will try and bring them into comply compliance. We will try and um, ensure that they apply for a license, but where there's non-compliance, we will be enforcing. This slide gives you, um, and I think you've seen it in Misha's slide uh, as well, just that highlights the wards that are in scheme two. This then leads on to the next slide and what I would be asking landlords here tonight is yes we want to create a level playing field for all landlords we want all landlords to be compliant um, they should be applying for licenses the properties should be licensed we're in the fourth the last year of licensing um, so if you are aware of an unlicensed property um, or a selective, which is a single family dwelling or an HMO, you can report these to us and we will be taking action. We will be taking action on every single case that we, we receive. Um, any inquiry that we receive, we will be we will be investigating those. So 
um, please email us on this email here. And there is also a, um, an e-form portal on our website and the link is here for you. I've then um, given you a couple of uh, case studies, which I won't read through, but just to give you a little flavour of what, what my officers do on a daily basis. So this is an example um, case where one of my officers received um, an inquiry from the tenant. Um, she went out to inspect the property and found that the ceiling had collapsed. So immediately there was, um, you know, danger to the family, imminent risk. So a closure order is an emergency prohibition order. And what we then did was referred this family to our housing options team and assist, they assisted them uh, with rehousing. And then we're dealing with um, taking on uh, enforcement action against the landlord. So usually what we do is we serve a notice, we work with our landlords to try and bring them into compliance. It's only when landlords don't cooperate with us that we then take further enforcement action. So the officer here is um, working with the landlord to remedy the problems that you can see there. Case study two, um, I'll let you read the content of this at your leisure, um, but just give you an overview um, of this. It was a three story um, property operating as a house in multiple occupation. They actually applied for a selective license saying that there was only a single family living in the property. We attempted to um, inspect the property many times. We couldn't gain access. We um, landlord was not cooperating. And then eventually um, we obtained a warrant of entry from the magistrate's court. And when we did enter and we executed the warrant, we found that it was actually operating. Um, as an HMO. So this case is still ongoing at the moment. It will, um, the prosecution will end up in a court and the court will make the decision. Okay, this is the last slide on case studies. Not all landlords are bad landlords, unfortunately. I'm, I'm sorry to say that I will give you the stories because I'm on the enforcement end. So, uh, you know, we come across non-compliant landlords. But this is a story where you can see from the pictures how the property was and where my officer has worked with the landlord to bring this property um, to a decent standard. So there were fire safety precautions here, some safety issues here. Um, and uh, as you can see, the, this is what it looked like the banisters looked like and this is um, what it looks like um, as it's remedied now when you look at the details of this case this is a landlord that worked with the officer to remedy the issues um, partnership working between enforcement officer and the landlord which resulted in uh, a safer property and that's it from me any questions and I think Richard will be managing the questions OK, thanks. Thank I think we've got a lot of questions on licensing. I think what we're going to do because we're 40 minutes in is I'm going to uh, save all of the questions now till the end on licensing and we'll use the kind of last 20 minutes or so to really cover uh, all of those. Um, uh, so you're staying with us till the end, aren't you, Shamol? Is that I right? Yes. yes, great. Um, so I'm going to move now on to my presentation, which is on life after section 21. So I'll just bring that up to share it. I think you might need to unshare. Can you see my presentation now? Yeah, we can yeah, see great. that, Richard. Okay. Yes. All right, yes. So I'm talking about the abolition of section 21, which is, is coming about because of the renters reform bill. First of all, let's just have a look at what Section 21 is. Now, this um, uh, was brought about in the 1988 Housing Act, um, where assured shorthold tenancies uh, were created by default when you let a, a property as a private landlord. Now, typically, um, we would have a fixed term of 12 months uh, in London. The minimum is six months, and some in some parts of the country, they tend to do six months. Um, the landlord can give two months notice without giving a reason under Section 21. And this is the issue that a lot of housing charities get 
very upset about and they think that that's wrong. The tenant can leave at the end of the fixed term without giving notice. Um, and also the, the tenancy can roll on to a statutory periodic tenancy. So that's where the landlord gives two months notice or the tenant can leave by just giving one month's notice. And there's this accelerated court process, which um, provided the land uh, the landlord has all of the uh, relevant paperwork uh, means that they don't have to go uh, actually to a court hearing. So it's well, it's meant to be accelerated when the courts are, are functioning well. Now we've seen erosion of Section 21 in recent years. So for Section 21 to be valid, you must have correctly provided the tenant with the deposit protection certificate within 30 days of receiving the deposit that was brought in in 2007, plus the prescribed information. A mandatory HMO or discretionary license where that's required. And also in the aptly named Deregulation Act, all of these new regulations came in. Um, all of these documents had to be given to the tenants, the gas safety certificate, the energy performance certificate, the government's latest how to rent booklet. And it must be uh, not a link. It must be the actual PDF of the booklet, the electrical safety certificate. And also there are time limits, of course, now. So if you don't use the Section 21 within a year, then you have to serve another one. And also retaliatory eviction provisions were brought in where you couldn't serve a Section 21 for six months um, if the tenant made a complaint um, to and the local authority served a notice. Section 21 was abolished in Scotland in 2017, and they now have private residential tenancies. So this is really the backdrop to the Renters Reform Bill, which uh, the white paper of which came out in June. And we are told now that the bill will be due in Parliament this session. So we expect it, I guess, to achieve royal assent by the summer, depending on what happens politically, of course. But it looks like the Sunak government is relatively stable at the moment. So just a quick summary. Tenancies will be periodic, so there'll be no fixed term. The tenant can just give two months notice at any time. Uh, but uh, uh, in order for the landlord to evict the tenant, they, they will have to use certain grounds under Section 8. So Section 21 will no longer exist. So if they want to sell the property or move in themselves, then they'll have to give the tenant two months notice and then they won't be able to let it again for th at least three months because obviously they're meant to then be selling it or, or moving in for a minimum of three months. Um, Note that a short shorthold tenancies will last for 12 months into the new system. So I think the earliest the new system will happen is April 2024. We've got to be given six months notice for the new system to come in. So let's imagine it, it gets to Royal Assent next June. Uh, by October, they decide they're going to give a six months notice and it comes in, in April 24. So your ASTs will then expire the following April 25, and well, they'll automatically become periodic tenancies then, um, the, and you won't be able to use the Section 21 after that. Now, I should say that timescale hasn't been confirmed, but that's, that's what I think it's going to be, more or less. But, you know, who knows? Anything could happen. Now, student landlords are going to be affected because, of course, at the moment we issue nine or 12 month tenancy agreements. But unless you've got purpose built student accommodation, you will just have to give open ended periodic tenancies. Um, there's going to be a change to the arrears arrangements. So there'll be four weeks notice for that if you want to go through the Section 8 process. Um, there's going to be a new grounds for repeated serious arrears. So if the tenant gets into two months notice three times over a three year period um, and tries to pay a little bit off on the day of the court hearing, if they do that three times, then that will be counted as repeated serious arrears and you could still get uh, a man mandatory possession. The arrangements for antisocial behaviour are a bit vague at the moment. And that's something that we're trying to get clarification on as, as the NRLA. Now, the government wants to modernise the courts. It says that it wants all uh, possession cases to be digitised by 2023. It wants to in introduce an ombudsman system, uh, so we'll all have to be members of uh, an ombudsman, uh, of the ombudsman rather, an ombudsman scheme. Uh, and it's also keen for us to use more mediation as well. It's talking about judges doing more sifting of urgent cases, so that if you've got an urgent ASB case, that could get prioritised, but we know that judges are very busy and I very much doubt that that's going to be possible. 
rent increases would be reserved to one per year and if, you'd have to use the section 13 notice uh, and give two months notice to tenants that you want to increase the rent uh, and if they wanted to they could go to a first tier tribunal to dispute that and the first tier tribunal could uh, rule in the landlord's favour but it couldn't propose a higher tenant uh, sorry a higher rent than what the landlord proposed. So currently, if you go to the rent officer service, the rent officer could propose a higher rent than what the landlord actually proposed. Well, that would no longer apply. And just briefly on other stuff, we won't be able to say no DSS or no families. I've put compulsory pets there, cheekily, but tenants will, uh, will be able to uh, have, have a pet in the property and landlords won't be un able to unreasonably refuse that. Now, that's actually similar to the current legislation. Uh, so, you know, if you do have an allergy or if there's a particular issue why pets wouldn't be allowable in in the property then you would be able to uh to refuse as long as it's not unreasonable the government was talking about passporting deposits from one landlord to the next but that's proved to be very tricky because of course if you make a, de a deduction from the deposit then how can it be passported across and it takes 10 days to make the deduction and uh inform the tenant etc so the government said that it's happy with arrangements like zero deposits um, and, and some of the other kind of markets uh, innovations that have come up and it's not going to bring in passporting as it had proposed. Um, so it wants to bring in decent home standards for the private rented sector that already exists in the social sector and it's currently consulting on what that might be. Um, it also wants there to be more local authority enforcement. The NRLA ag agrees on that. Currently, 50% um, of enforcement is carried out by 20 local authorities across England. So we want to see more local authorities doing more enforcement in a more consistent way. And it also proposes a property portal. So all privately rented properties would need to be advertised on the portal. And it's suggested that we might have to upload gas safety certificates and electrical certificates and so on. It could in effect be a kind of register. And some people like myself have proposed that the portal you know, could be a default national register and could we replace licensing with the portal? And that's something that I think would be very positive and a lot of landlords are talking about that. Um, let's look at the impact of abolishing Section 21 in Scotland. It wasn't called Section 21 there, it had a different name. They have seen uh, a decline in the size of the PRS, only a slight one so far. It is 14% in Scotland, so the private rental sector is slightly smaller there, it's 20% in, in uh, the UK as a whole. And what they've seen is the same number of landlords are selling as buying. Young professionals have been by and large unaffected, but there has been a hardening of attitudes regarding referencing. And that means that landlords in Scotland are less likely to house riskier categories. So um, tenants on benefits, for example, and, and students, because, um, you know, the, the provisions mean that the contracts are unending and you know if you need to go on a kind of student cycle of nine months or 12 months then some student landlords have decided that the system just doesn't work for them just looking briefly at nrla research we asked land asked landlords um when they use the section 8 and when they use the section 21 as you can see um, they use uh, Section 8 and Section 21s broadly, but half and half around rent arrears. But where they really do use Section 21s around illegal behaviour by tenants, damage to the property, antisocial behaviour to sell the property, to move into the property, to allow family members to move in, to make renovations. Um, so there are lots of reasons why landlords are using Section 21 at the moment. And that's because, of course, it's easier and quicker and you don't have to go to court very often. We asked landlords what they thought about the new proposals. We had 3,500 responses. Four in five landlords said they will continue if the reforms work. Um, they said they were reasonably comfortable with using Section 8 for arrears, but not for things like antisocial behaviour and damage. And they also lamented the lack of help from police 
and local authorities when they needed help around antisocial behaviour. Most landlords believe that the possession proposals and court reforms are insufficient, up 72% and 69% respectively. Landlords expect the supply to decrease, so they think 89% uh, of landlords said they thought rents will rise, 93% said the number of available properties will fall, and 69% saw that more landlords would shift to short lets. They also thought that 66% uh, said that there'd be a shift to build to rent. At the moment, the build to rent sector is very small. There are just 69,000 completed build to rent properties across the UK. Um, but landlords seem to think that, you know, there'll be more institutional investors coming in because of the abolition of Section 21. 76% of landlords expect to, uh, to be more selective. 60% uh, said they're highly likely to screen tenants more rigorously. And they think that low income tenants could be hit hardest. Just over half uh, said uh, they don't intend to sell, but they expect to benefit from a sell off by other landlords. And landlords held a dim view of the property portal. 63% said it's just another big scheme that will cost landlords lots of money and, and will be a failure. Most landlords were unconcerned with meeting the decent homes standard. Over 80% said that they thought their properties were, did have fit for purpose facilities or in a reasonable state of repair. So let's have a quick look at how landlords are behaving. Um, well, first of all, we'll have a quick look at the economic context. Uh, sterling has been falling. It's recovered recently, although it's, it fell again today after the uh, the bank changed the interest bank of England changed the interest rate. Interest rates are of course rising. They rose from two point two five percent to three percent today. Inflation is expected to peak at eleven percent. The Bank of England expects us to go into a two year recession now, and and says that we may already be in a recession, and that will continue until mid twenty twenty four. There are predictions that the housing market could fall between 5 and 15 percent over the next year. And of course, the, the drivers really here are the Ukraine conflict, which is pushing up fuel prices. We've got labour and supply shortages, which have been caused by COVID and Brexit. We've noticed a drop in landlord optimism compared to a year ago. There's been a severe decline in confidence across all key optimism indicators according to NRLA research. There have been sharp falls across landlord expectations of the UK financial market, down 38%, with landlords also feeling a lot less optimistic about the prospects for the UK private rental sector, that's down by 36%, their own lettings business down by 32%, capital gains down by 31%, and rental yields down by 30%. So I'm afraid, I'm afraid we are all feeling pretty miserable. And I went to the um, Property Investor Show in October. I've also been to the National Landlord Investment Show as well uh, yesterday. And there's a bit of gloom going on. We're a bit frustrated and also uh, rather a lot of uncertainty. Certainly we're seeing more landlords selling and the drivers there are Section 24 tax, which means that landlords pay 60% tax and are taxed on their turnover rather than on their profits. We pay the additional stamp duty, of course. The changes to mortgage regulations mean that we often need bigger deposits. We pay capital gains tax of 28% when we sell property, when it's 20% for other assets. We're going to be expected to pay up to £10,000 per property to improve the energy efficiency um, by 2025 if government proposals um, go uh, do uh, get put into place. That's to get an, e uh, an EPC of C for rented properties. And there's been a general sense the government wants to turn generation rent into generation buy and a lot of political antipathy from politicians. I'll say a little bit more about, about that shortly. Um, there's a shortage of rented properties, of course. Capital economics research tells us that 225,000 private rented units are needed uh, every year going forward. And yet the private rented sector is shrinking. We've lost 260,000 properties in the last five years. Research by Property Mark showed that there'd been a 50% fall in lettings availability um, uh, over the past year. 14% of landlords are looking to buy in the next 12 months, but 23% are looking to sell. And we've seen a failure really of successive government policy. So we lost 3 million council houses between 1979 and 1995, that, uh, and they weren't replaced, of course, uh, they were sold off. Uh, there's been a failure to build enough. We've 
that people argue that there are too many planning constraints. So a lot of frustrations and, you know, uh, we're really seeing a shortage of properties and the government, a lot of landlords would argue, need to ease up on some of those tax restrictions uh, to stop landlords from selling up. Just very briefly to uh, mention our, our rising interest rates, of course, Peter's going to talk about this in a bit more detail. Rates were increased to 3% today, and Peter will obviously headline that shortly. They were expected to peak at about five and a quarter percent, but we're hearing that they might peak at around four percent. Be interesting to see what Peter thinks. We've got the autumn statement coming on the 17th of November, so let's see how the markets react to that. Again, the NRLA has done research on this, and we asked landlords when bank base rate was 1.75 percent, which was a few months ago now. Uh, they've already gone up by another 1.25, obviously. We said to landlords, if interest rates rose by two percent, what would you have to do? And 18% said we'd have to sell property. And they said if interest rates went, I suppose, up to 5.75, 30% said they'd have to sell property. We are seeing this big gap between bank base rate and pay rates on fixed products. And again, be interesting to see what Peter says about that. But what I've seen are, um, or I should say, is 6.04% actually for two year fix from the mortgage works and 5.74 on a five year fix. Um, so, you know, rates have gone up considerably and, and landlords are facing this big jump in payments when they come off two or five year fixes um, this year or next. Um, and, uh, you know, I've certainly got uh, mortgages of 1.25, 1.45, 1.65 that are going to come out of their fixes next year. And that's going to be quite a stressful moment, I think. Two million borrowers will come off fixed rates in the next two years. That's the stats I've got. And again, be interesting to see what Peter's thoughts are on that. So let's start to consider what the world might look like after Section 21. Uh, is abolished. And as I say, that could be the earliest I think that could be is probably April 2024. So we're seeing this decline in numbers. Um, I think we're likely to see a more professional cohort of landlords. As I say, we've already seen this fall of 260,000 in the last five years. Will we see an improvement in property standards? Well, potentially. But of course, if there's strong demand, um, caused by limited supply, um, it, you know, that could well mean that poor properties will still get let because people are just so desperate for, for anything that's on the market. Referencing will, of course, be vital. Um, and I think it's really important that you get um, checks on employment, previous landlord, and, and also do credit checks to check that people don't have county court judgments. And credit checks in increasingly is going to start to include rental payment history. I've noticed when I look on my credit file now at Experian, there is a section on that. You know, I'm not a renter, I'm an owner occupier. So obviously there's no data in that. It's not been populated, but um, increasingly um, credit referencing agencies like Experian are collecting data from landlords about the rental payment history of tenants. And, and that's great for us and, and for tenants in many ways because it could help their credit score. We probably are going to see some changes to the market, I think. So we may well see a shift to short lets so that people fall outside the scope of the new legislation. But beware that the government is carrying out a consultation on short lets at the moment. So there could be some changes to regulation on that. There could be an opportunity for build to rent. And there are some markets, say, for example, in Germany, where institutional investors are, you know, the biggest suppliers of, of privately rented property. I don't think we're going to see a huge shift in that, but you know, we could see a, a, a gradual trickle towards that. We might see a greater use of agents. And in fact, in our survey, 29% of landlords said they thought we would see a greater use of agents. Interestingly, I think agents are going to have to shift their model, aren't they? Because very often uh, they will charge the sort of commission for one a one year let. Well, of course, if tenancy agreements are open ended, then um, you know, it's 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 probably going to be a month by month fee that agents are going to charge because, you know, we won't know how long the tenant's going to be there for. Um, just looking at the attitudes of tenants, well, they're going to have these new freedoms, I guess. Um, you know, because they can just leave whenever they want and just give two months notice. I guess that's going to be harder for landlords to plan. 
Um, I wonder if they're going to be open to negotiation, you know, so that you don't end up having to go to court. But of course, that wouldn't be enforceable if you hadn't gone to court. You know, it may be that we end up going to court or going through mediation more often. We could end up with a situation where tenants feel very empowered, but landlords feel quite frustrated. Even if the courts are digitised by 2023, will they really be able to cope with the new volume? And we've got a lot of regulation coming on the way with the decent home standard, new stuff on fire, safety and so on. Could financing become more expensive? And again, it might be interesting to see what Peter says about that. Lenders might decide that there's going to be an increased level of risk for the lender because Section 21 no longer exists. The landlord can still evict the tenant if they want to sell, of course, but if it then takes 10 months to go through court, that's going to take longer than it does with Section 21 at the moment. And there are still Section 8 grounds, and we still expect that for the lender to be able to repossess the property if they need to. Now, could politics make a difference? Well, Rishi Sunak, uh, obviously new Prime Minister, Liz Truss is ancient history now, isn't she? He has unfortunately reappointed Michael Gove, and I say that because the landlord community is universally very depressed about that because he has been very unsympathetic to the landlord community. Um, if you've got more than three properties, you can't get support around cladding. So, you know, that was an anti-landlord measure that he brought in in spite of NRLA lobbying. And in fact, they were going to say if you had more than one property, you didn't couldn't get help with cladding. But because of our lobbying, we managed to at least get that up to three. But of course, the government's going to be making considerable cuts. So will there be funds to bring in a property portal and do court reform? Quite possibly not. The Labour Party are saying they want to become more business friendly. But I think there's a big problem with them not seeing landlords as businesses. Um, and also, we've still got that hard left um, side of the Labour Party that was around during the Corbyn period that I think is still thriving at branch and constituency level, particularly in London. And, you know, they will eventually get fed up, I think, of Keir Starmer and the more sort of centrist nature of the Labour Party. But currently, we still have quite a, a strong um, anti-landlord element, I think, in the Labour Party. Would we prefer the Conservatives to bring this bill in or Labour? Some people say if we've got to get rid of Section 21, maybe it's better for the Conservatives to do that. Maybe, maybe Labour would do it in a much more aggressive way. So I think that's an interesting point. And changes to taxation. Well, obviously, we'd really like to see uh, Section 24 changes where we are taxed on our turnover rather than on our profits and we can only reclaim uh, get uh, tax back at 20%, even if we pay 40% tax around finance costs. I think there's been talk of possibly bringing back mortgage interest relief, it was called MIRAS, of course, in the 80s, to help everybody, landlords and owner-occupiers, with rising interest rates, but whether that will gain any currency, who knows. So just finally, some words on buy, sell or hold. Uh, is it a good time to buy? Well, will house prices fall? And in, in which case is it best to wait? Also, fixed finance is quite expensive at the moment and the stress tests have been going up on buy-to-let loans, making it difficult to raise funds. So I'm not sure if now is a good time to buy. Um, and in fact, I, I believe that buyer inquiries have gone down by 40% in the southeast, according to Zoopla, over the past month. Is it a good time to hold? Well, we're likely to see higher demand and, and possibly higher rents. Um, of course, uh, the private rent sector is going to continue to be a political football, so that can be an irritant, you know, if you decide to stay in the market. We are also going to see increasing regulation and you may well have to cough up that 10,000 per property because of the minimum energy efficiency standards. Is now a good time to sell? Well, remember, you're going to have to deal with a, a capital gains tax bill, and many of us have made substantial gains in the last decade. The market might be about to turn. So, but, you know, is it better to sell now rather than wait till prices go down? Um, you might want to just avoid that post Section 21 regime and just get out of the market now. So, you know, that could be one of your considerations. I think the next good time to sell might not be until the end of the 2020s when you know the market perhaps starts to go up again then so you know it may well be that it's now or wait until the end of the decade so just to finish off now 
Um, just to remind you about uh, the podcast, which is called Listen Up Landlords. If you're interested, do uh, Google Listen Up Landlords and uh, we do one of those every month. Um, and also, it would be delighted for you to join the NRLA if you're not already a member. Just Google join the NRLA and you can join for £85 per year by di direct debit. That is the £15 price off, which you get using my discount code, which is R59. Just to mention a couple of future events, one in Broxbourne uh, that's coming up next week at the council offices there, and also the Barking and Dagenham webinar is at, on the 6th of December. Just go to the NRLA website for more details on that. And also there's the phone number if you want to call the NRLA advice line. And the other representatives for London are Yvonne Basden and Karen Gregory. I'm East and Northeast, Yvonne is West and Northwest, and Karen Gregory is South London. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing that. What I'm going to do now, actually, again, I'm going to wait till the end, I think, to see if you've got any questions on my presentation, because I wasn't able to look through the chat there. Um, I've mentioned quite a lot about increasing interest rates, and I think now's the good moment to hand over to Peter, uh, who's going to give us the lowdown on uh, what happened with Bank of England increase today and how that might affect mortgage rates. So over to Peter van der Benin. Thank Oops, you. you're muted, Peter. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much, Richard. Yeah, uh, let me share my screen first of all, please. OK, thank you. I'll tell you when it's up. There we go. Right, let's start from there. Great. There we go. That's all working well. Thanks, Peter. There we go. OK, thank you very much. Whoops, let's get rid of that. OK, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, Richard, and uh, I'll try and cover as many points as you came up with uh, as soon as possible. Right, here we go. That's what happened today. Um, base rate is at 3%. Um, but Richard kept on going about base rate and uh, that climbing, will it affect uh, interest rates? I'll come on to that later on because actually the Bank of England base rate doesn't correlate to in fixed interest rates. It does if you have a tracker mortgage that track is, tracks the Bank of England base rate. I'll explain how that works later on in the presentation. OK, why are they doing it? Um, well, this is the projection. This is a Bank of England slide that they produced today on where inflation has been, where they think it's going to go, um, and what the projection is as well. Um, so they like to keep inflation, um, as a monetarist economy, we like to try and keep inflation in a banding of a, between just below or just above 2%, um, and that's where they're trying to keep it. And obviously at the moment, we're just slightly above 10 um, they're predicting to 25, it may possibly get in the banding of a bit higher than that. But obviously after that, they're predicting the inflation to come down. OK, you know, some good news about that. You know, the gas, the gas price firm, if anybody's been following it, we follow a lot of these indices, which I'll show you later on. Uh, that has come down tremendously. The problem is it's going to take two to three months, four months for that to filter through. Um, so yeah, it's it, there's some positive vibes on the uh, on the horizon. This is where base rate has uh, has come from, um, where it is today, and also where their prediction is. Now, some of the predictions are where I've put this. This is only a projection. It's a bit out of date. You know, yes, they've been putting up interest rates to try and stem inflation and bring that down. However, um, it looks like we're going to into a global recession. If there is a recession and it's longer, then it'd be more difficult for um, central banks to actually increase uh, bank base rate. So I'm not so sure that, you know, this is a personal opinion. I'm not so sure it's going to follow those lines. OK. Um, and I think I agree with what Richard said. Uh, I think uh, bank base rate will max out at four. Um, it might not get as high as that. We'll wait and see. But in the short term, yes, there's some more bad news, I'm afraid, to come, or what pe people perceive as bad news. 
Okay, so what's been happening in the, the mortgage market? Well, yes, as I'm sure you're all aware, mortgage rates have risen sharply, but um, there is some good news. These last couple of weeks, the first, not, not this week, last week, we've definitely seen residential rates come down a little bit off the peak. And this week we've had uh, some buy to let rates uh, also come down. Again, I'll come on to where I think that's going in, the, in, the, in further slides. The thing that really took uh, took us by surprise, and um, I uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, made 40 years in financial services, um, but it, it really did surprise me. We lost uh, four and a half thousand products in, in, in the space of 48 hours. It was unprecedented, never seen it before. Um, I was quoting people as I'm talking to you now, send them a quote. And by the time they'd got the email, had a look at the quote, the deal had gone and, and lenders were pulling rates without giving, giving us any notice. Um, because I have a foot in both camps, because I know lots of heads are lending and so on, I do understand how it works both ways, uh, but that doesn't help you making decisions if you're buying a property or swapping rates. But as Richard said, um, the biggest problem that we are having at the moment uh, are stress tests and I have a number of my clients at the moment that are becoming at the moment if rates don't drop a bit and stress tests becoming what we call mortgage prisoners so the lender they may be with might not op offer them a product switch rate um, but because of the rental stress tests I can't move them anywhere else as well and they may not have any money to reduce their loan size um, the government don't want to create um, mortgage prisoners, so I think something will be done about it. At the moment, obviously, they've got a lot on their mind at the moment, but I think that will happen with the uh, Financial Conduct Authority and the uh, Financial Regulation Authority as well. They'll be, well, I know they're consulting at the moment, so that may change. Okay. There are two main areas to cover here. What has happened and why, and what happens next. OK, and what has caused all the volatility? Well, obviously, inflation was one of those factors and along with the Ukrainian war, as long as, the, you know, as Richard has alluded to. But the biggest factor that were, that were really took it, the, the wind out of ourselves was the mini budget. Um, yeah, obviously, it's all been very well documented and I'm sure you know uh, what went on, but that's the reason for that short term spike. And I'm going to come on to how and why that happened. This resulted in uh, obviously the, the pound against the dollar dropping, um, but as you can see, that's climbed up. So that's actually some positive territory off the bot off the bottom. Uh, and government borrowings, so that's guilt uh, for anybody that wants to. This is how the government financed their, uh, let's say, overdraft, for instance. Um, this is the cost of borrowing. Didn't help that a couple of weekends or a couple of Saturdays ago that. Moody's, the big credit refer reference agency, uh, downgraded the UK to negative, which wasn't unsurprising. Uh, bear in mind that the uh, shenanigans that's been going on in the government. Um, hopefully, um, after the autumn statement, I'm hoping that that might be regraded uh, and this will bring down bonds uh, quite a bit. Uh, that's guilt, bonds, whatever you want to call them. And I'll uh, say explain. This is where interest rates, but they've actually climbed higher than this. Uh, this is actually, um, as you can see, almost it's, well, it's a month out of date today, isn't it? Let's just go on. But where rates are, this is where rates are at the moment. We've got these, the, the orange line here is individual mortgages. This is where they sit at the moment. Specialist here, and then you've got limited company ordinary properties and sort of HMO specialists, multi-unit blocks and so on. Um, so yeah, that's fairly accurate. Now, the red lines that have just come up, these are tracker products, uh, which obviously track the Bank of England base rate. Well, obviously they're now three quarters of a percent more than that. But some of the tracker products are quite attractive. Um, the lenders have been thinking outside this, the square. And in, in truthfulness, we've done quite a few of these trackers. Would you want to get yourself into a seven and a quarter, five year fix? Um, 
is base rate going to go above the margin? You know, it's there's a whole debate. So what we've really been doing with all our customers is just making sure this is a two year fix, this is a five year fix, there's some seven year fixes and some 10 year fixes. There's also quite a number of trackers. The interesting thing about the trackers are that um, uh, a lot of them have very low redemption penalties or quite a number of them at the moment, whilst they're still there, some, some of them have no redemption penalties whatsoever. So that could maybe give, uh, give you an option. What my job is to my clients is making sure that we give them all options. We talk through the advantages and disadvantages of each one uh, and then make a decision from there. OK, at the moment, <coughs> excuse me, most of, most of my clients um, are on sort of a hold. If they don't need to make a decision today, maybe they've got a rate coming up at the end of January, then we're just holding fire, sitting on the fence, see where things are going. And I'm going to come on to that. Uh, where what happens next? Well, hopefully, obviously, that we 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 think that the, the pound of strength and against the dollar, the US has had some very bad economic news over the last couple of weeks, and the Fed put their uh, interest rate up. Um, so we're hoping that the pound will strengthen against that. We're hoping that bond yields keep coming down. Now, I want to cover that in this slide. There is a common misconception that uh, bank base rate actually affects fixed rates. I'm afraid that is not true. Main, the main driver is bond yields. OK, so this is the government borrowing, the gilts that I showed you earlier. Um, and this is where you can see that they fairly well track one another. OK. And this is where mortgage rates are. So in between here is a swap rate. Now, swap rate is what the lenders buy the money in off the, off the wholesale market. So you've got bond yields here, you've got swap rates, OK, and then mortgage rates. The margin, oh, sorry, go back one, bear with me. Um, the green line here is their margin. So they buy the money in, they add their margin on, and they lend it to you. With bond, rate, uh, bond rates dropping, we're hoping that uh, the fixed rates will also drop. Uh, and therefore, obviously, what you get offered in, uh, you know, is the end user will also drop. Um, I put together a webinar on Tuesday night for uh, a lot of serious investors that we have and a, and a property networking event. Uh, and I had four lenders, four, well, I had an owner of a mortgage company and three specialist lenders, heads of lending. So we covered uh, Land Bay, Precise, Kent, uh, Kent Reliance, Interbay, um, who else? Uh, Keystone Mortgages um, and West One. Um, so there was a lot of input into the specialist uh, market. Um, and one of the heads of lending there, so he, which was Precise, Kent Reliance and Interbay, they, they produced reduced rates today but they had a lending reduced, uh, sorry, he um, alluded to that uh, he would probably further reduce rates probably next week, maybe the week after. But there was more positive notes than we've had for some quite a while. So maybe that's the time to sit on that fence. Where do I think rates will settle? And this has been put together after talking to lots, lots of uh, heads of lending. As we've grown as a broker, brokerage, uh, you know, I started the brokerage on my own. Um, there's, there's there's 11 of us now. Um, we get to talk to the people that are actually buying the money that make the decisions. So where I think the new norm will be, um, I think residential rates will be between we're four and five percent. Maybe they get under the four percent bracket. Uh, buy to let rates, depending on when you're in the specialist sector, you know, HMO or uh, that type of thing, or service accommodation and so on, between five and six again, they might just get under five. Okay. But this is going to be a new norm. Okay. We're not going to get back to 3% five year fixes. You've got to realize that is not, um, you know, that ship has sailed, as they say. Uh, if you've managed to get into any of those in the last year, 18 months, then you've done very well and you've got plenty of time to plan for these types of rates. But as Richard said, you know, 
there is a, you know definitely a lack of property of properties to rent rents will go up whether people will be able to afford them of course we'll have to wait and see okay this is quite interesting there's only a few bits it's quite a busy slide here this is actually from uh, the mortgage works uh, they um, survey their landlords uh, they're one of the biggest lenders alongside bm solutions in the last um, last few years and therefore obviously quite cutting edge in the in the uh, data and Richard came up with some of these, but 28% of landlords are likely to sell property in the next 12 months. Okay, so that's quite interesting. That was quite an increase on the last one they did last month. Optimism, as you can see here, this one with this, this circle over here, you'll see that optimism has dropped quite a lot. And that goes along with what, again, with what Richard was saying. Yeah, um, I, I quite understand it. Um, and uh, not as bad as the the, the, the uh, optimism for uh, a mortgage broker uh, that is also a portfolio landlord. So I've got a double whammy of uh, um, uh, depression at the moment. <laughs> but we always come out of these things at the end of the day. Let's look at the positive sides. Um, positive side here is that they've seen uh, tenant demand rise significantly. You know, 40 percent rise in um you know in, in tenant demand so there is a demand out there for it it's just whether we can supply it with uh, you know decent levels of funding okay don't know if anybody saw this article on the bbc website it was actually very very interesting where um uh, ray bulger is a big in, a big industry expert in the mortgage industry um he's the sort of uh, head concho at john charcoals um they are the whole article was very interesting they're lobbying the government um they're trying to make them understand that um if landlords can't make money then they're going to get less properties less properties means that people will have to knock on the council's door for temporary accommodation um which we all end up paying for anyway um you know, lots of councils in uh, are in problems. I live in uh, Bexley Heath. The Bexley Council had to be bailed out by um, the government last year, so we're going to probably going to see more of that. Um, they've got to understand that they should uh, really help us landlords minimise some of the costs, so that they don't end up with more, a bigger bill, a bigger bill than trying to squeeze us. Okay, but there is lobbying. Um, we interact with the Bank of England every month. So tomorrow I'll be presenting at a, um, a property event in Birmingham. Um, and at that time, we would do our debrief uh, webinar with the MPC members. We got invited on there a number of years ago. Um, and so we'll be talking to them, delivering to the networking group what's gone on, why they made their decisions and how they made them and where they see things going. So we'll get a little bit more on nitty gritty. But uh, the NRLA, you know, uh, my mortgage association, we're all lobbying the government on your behalf. But like Richard said, and when we were talking about the licenses, you also got to do it. You know, collectively, you can have a bigger voice. OK, what do we do as brokers? Well, um, we're very, very much 50%, uh, 50%, 60% in the buy to let market. We're also uh, heavily in the residential market, um, bridging, um, development finance, that type of thing. We've put together a, what we call a broker pack. I cannot, honestly, I cannot stress enough now that over these next couple of years of making sure that you're ready to grab whatever rates are around there. We expect as rates to, uh, do come down, um, there's some false pricing in the market at the moment. But what I see is that lenders will probably come down with tranches of money. So you see this headline rate with loads of benefits on it. But what you're going to need to do is grab it. You're going to need to grab it straight away and go, yes, Mr. Broker, yes, Peter, whoever your broker is, um, I want that deal. We're going to need to be able to make sure that we can supply everything, all accurate information, accurate documentation um, at the, the point of application. You've got more chance of securing that rate. Um, so we've put a pack together um, which gives you some ideas. Anybody wants that, then please uh, you know, email me. I'll put my email address in the chat box later. 
uh, with a website, but we can email that to you. We've got a cutting edge um, CRM system. We can give you access. It's blockchain. Um, it will. It's very intuitive. Uh, you can have an app on your phone, that type of thing, if you want to engage with us. Um, I'm happy also to do a strategy call. Uh, I am a landlord. We do know all the strategies of making money out of property. Uh, and maybe I might better give you some angles on, on that if that's when we have pre-approved appointments in my diary. OK, um, and that's us. Uh, we're based in uh, Crayford um, by the Dartford Bridge. Um, soon to be online only. Um, we can have face to face appointments generally done on Zoom and so on. Uh, we can have a physical meetings as well. We just need to do that by appointment. Um, Richard, is there anything that you, you've listened to that I haven't covered that you'd like me to quickly uh, expand on? No, I think that was very comprehensive, actually, Peter. Um, I think that the next thing that somebody asked for your details and you've just provided them there. So thank you very much. That's great. Um, and I'm just looking to see if we've got any questions. So um, if you've got a question for Peter. Sorry, Andy, Richard, I've, I've just noted a horrendous mistake by my, but I don't do the slides. But we're not um, with dot code at UK. Um, I will put it in the chat box for you. Uh, so I do apologise about that. Right. So the email address is inquiries at the mortgage consultancy dot co dot UK. Yes. And if you want me personally, just substitute inquiries for Peter. I'm going to put that in the uh, um, in the chat box as well for you. Lots of love coming towards you, Peter, in the chat. Perfect. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> thank you for those. Though compliments uh we, any, we do, any we questions do, for so we do YouTube. do free webinars for people occasionally um what we try and do is educate uh landlords like you are doing richard um you know we we've given the power to make those decisions and a very a collaborative approach rather than just quoting a rate we don't just quote rates we try and give yeah. some science okay I've got six mortgages coming up next, well, over the next 14 months, actually, Peter. Um, and they're all currently on, well, most of them on 1.25, 1.45 and 1.65% fixed rates. So you can imagine how how much in, intrepidation I'm facing the next 14 months with. Of course, of course it does. And I may well be slipping on to variable rates for a little while, you know, if there are no early repayment charges until fixed rates get better. So um you know it just depends what happens but i think i was encouraged today by what i heard about bank base rate not going as high as perhaps we thought it might do and i'm i'm certainly hoping that it won't go higher than 4 4.25 so let, let's see what happens yeah no, someone else absolutely. says the same here they've also got two year fixes coming to an end um so yeah OK, thanks very much, Peter. I'm just looking in the chat to see if we've got any questions from uh, my presentation or from licensing um, that have gone unanswered so far. So bear with me whilst I go through and just have a look. I see that uh, colleagues from the council have answered quite a few questions. Um, Right. Someone asked, we are considering issuing the Section 21 to our tenant and his family this month. Um, who do we inform as they have four children and the parents receive housing benefit or do we direct them to the council when we issue the Section 21? Um, that's from Debbie. Um, well, you don't actually need to inform the council. Um, about the housing benefit it, it's really up to the tenant to do that i think debbie you don't uh i don't can't think of any other way of answering that at, uh there so i'm not quite sure what you're looking for but maybe you want to provide me a bit more clarification there debbie because i'm not quite sure why you're asking that um any other questions let's have a look no, I can't find any that are not unanswered. Uh, I think a lot of them have been answered now. Excuse me whilst I just look through them. OK, <laughs> Myra says landlords are the devil incarnate. 
Well, yes, some people would have you believe that's Myra. <laughs> uh, I think everything's been answered so far, so I'll just go down to the new ones now and see what else. Yes, um, someone brings up this issue of council still telling tenants to ignore Section 21 notices and wait for the bailiffs. Um, yeah, in 2016, Brandon Lewis, the housing minister, told them not to. I agree with you, you there. I think that was brought up in some government guidance, but it, I hear a lot of anecdotal evidence that local authorities are telling tenants where they receive a Section 21 notice just to stay put until you're dragged out by a bailiff. Now, I think what's going on there, you know, is that basically there's so little temporary housing and accommodation available that councils just want tenants to stay put for as long as possible. So I think really a lot of that is about councils just not having any resources or any other units to put tenants into. But I also agree with you that it's very frustrating for for landlords when that happens. Um, uh, who to report? This is from Shrita. Who to report if the estate agency is not giving back my property even after giving them notice? Well, you can make a complaint to the estate agent and if they don't, you're not happy with the outcome of that, you then complain to the ombudsman. Um, and all estate agents must be members, oh, sorry, the redress scheme. All estate agents must by law be members of a redress scheme. And if they're not members of a redress scheme, then you should report them to trading standards. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on this business of um, local authorities telling tenants to stay put until they're removed by bailiffs. Um, I mean, we probably need to, I don't know if we we have people from the right teams to discuss that. Nick, do you want to respond to that question or comment? No, I haven't. I know our housing option team, Richard, would I think would like to come and, uh, to the to the next meeting if possible, certainly to talk about what the options for renting from the council would be. And they're probably mm. best place to do, best place to do that. So, I mean, what I would say, Redbridge in particular, if you go back and look through the statistics, we have a, you know, there's 110,000 properties. There are four and a half thousand owned by the council. Uh, that's it. So when you're looking at waiting lists uh, and that sort of thing, the social uh, sector is about the equivalent size. We are, you know, there is a there is a dearth of properties around. Um, but I don't yeah. think we've got anyone on the call that can help with specifics. I did put in the chat our housing options team and how to contact them. If they've got any queries there. Um, and as I say, they would like to, if, if, if you know, come come to a, a future meeting anyway, and probably put the questions directly to them. That would be great, I think. Yes, because it is a, a, a common frustration. I think with landlords. There is a question here from Sean McLean, and in fact, somebody asked me about this at the National Landlord Investment Show yesterday, specifically about Redbridge. Not uh, the existing selective licensing scheme required landlords to acquire 90 CPD points. Um, I'm not sure if that's correct, but maybe someone can can um, advise us on that. What I, are the plans for the second term? I, is there are limited courses to get another 90 CPD I, points I and did, it's very costly. I did stick an answer in the chat. Um, if you look through the proposed conditions on the selective licensing scheme, I put them related to management and development. If they if they don't meet the needs or there's better solutions to that, um, then by all means, you know, feed that back during the consultation. Right, OK. And uh, Shreet is asking about getting a discount if you join the NRLA. So the discount code is R59. So that's R59. If you just go online um, to join the NRLA and put in R59, then you will get the discount. Uh, gosh, lots of questions coming in. Um, Alan, your question on agents, I'm afraid there's so many questions I can't find that. So you, you probably should just rewrite that again, I'm afraid, Alan. Um, so Z's asking about submitting the compliance check under the landlord license. I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Z Shan. That's not very clear. Right, so Alan says, in the past, we did not need a licence if we rented to a council appointed agent who placed council tenants in the property. Now that now we are told we need a licence but cannot meet the conditions as we have no access to the tenant 
or property, please clarify. So can anyone from Redbridge clarify that one for us? I think, hi, I think Cheryl did put a reply in there. Cheryl, do you want to come in on that, on the uh, PSL leasing? Sorry, I just realised I'm muted. Private sector leasing is um, where properties are given to the council long term to be used and the council has some control over the management of the property. Um, basically, they are like the management, but the, as far as I'm aware, the owner is still classed as the so the owner is still classed as the landlord as such, but the um, Redbridge Council have taken over the management of it while they've got at least fire them and they might use a letting agents to help them. I mean, Richard might be able to confirm or not confirm that, but that's how I understand it's, it's um, arranged with them. OK, thank you, Cheryl. Um... Oh, when will the decision be made on the selective licensing scheme too? I think that's has been answered previously, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's basically, it's obviously when the consultation finishes and then it will go to Duluc and then it depends well, what it's happens. Well, an anticipated uh, it will go back to our cabinet in March uh, 2023 and obviously depending on the outcome of that, what goes forward in terms of the nature of scheme or schemes or designation and again, if it if part of it uh, is over 20% then it, it requires an application to the Secretary of State. Um, so, I mean, the timelines would be for the introduction of a new scheme is probably looking around with with the public. If if we went ahead with publications of designation notices with uh, applications to the Secretary of State, you're probably looking for uh, a sort of introduction around the 1st of November 2023. And the Secretary of State can take several months to come uh, back, uh, aren't they, Nick? So, absolutely, yeah. we've mm. we've built in, and uh, clearly there's there's you know clearly there's a change. So I mean, you know, it, it, it we will know more. You know, a range of options. Obviously, the feedback from the consultation, cabinet make a decision about what they will wish to proceed with, uh, on behalf of Redbridge, and then again there are a number of other steps, including all the relevant publications or other approvals. So as I say, I think it's looking realistically like, uh, well. It, nothing happens until the current scheme expires, which is the 30th of September 23. So you're you're looking at winter 23. OK, um, Misha, um, Julia is asking if the tenant forum is still taking yeah, place. Okay. I've just put a reply in the chat. Um, those meetings haven't been held more recently, but we are looking to reinvigorate those. Um, and also we want to hear from them as part of the consultation. So if you do know anyone, please um, email us um, to let us know and actually that email address um, sorry Julia should be the Mel research one for the consultation um, but you can also email the PRS licensing as well and we certainly want to be speaking to tenants over the next couple of months while the consultation is live so yeah do encourage your tenants to get involved that would be great Richard, uh, Cheryl, uh, would you need a selective licence for supported accommodation? It depends on, um, well, chances are yes, um, unless it's actually a non-profit um, organisation and it's either been run by Redbridge or the NHS or something like that. Um, and it depends on what it is, it depends if it's a single household or if it's two or three unrelated people. So it could, you know, it could actually be an HMO, so it just depends on how many people but you can always email PRS licensing and give us the scenario and we can answer you that, that's the best thing to do at a case by case basis okay I was just going to uh, say um Richard there's somebody called Freeman who's got their hand up <laughs> all right okay um before I go to Freeman uh how does anyone know how to save the chat somebody's asked how to save it um Sorry. I don't know if Qatar in uh, technical support maybe you could uh, answer that in the chat Tonu has asked that. Um, and let's just have a look now at the person who's got their hand up called Freeman. And um, I'll just go down the list. So it's quite a lot of you. Right. Let's uh, let's try and muting Freeman then so that you can 
speak. I think Katara needs to do that. So yeah, he like just needs to, to unmute more? the microphone now. He's been the microphone's been okay. Now. So oh, there we go. Yep. Uh, so I think uh, Freeman, are you there? Can you hear us? Can you speak to us? I think you need to unmute your own mic now. Just give you a moment to unmute your own mic. How's that? Yes, hello. What's do introduce yourself? Good evening. Yeah, so I was at the original meeting uh, with Jazz Atwell, um, what, four years ago now? At Redbridge Library. And one of the reasons for bringing in selective licensing, he said, was the amount of antisocial call outs to private rented property. He was asked in front of 100 people how many of those call outs were uh, universal credit or council tenants that we had taken on and he said we will find out for you we are still waiting okay yes so um i think this is a point that's often made isn't it that you know this idea that there's more antisocial behavior in the private rented sector is is not fair and not reasonable um and the reason why antisocial behavior is brought up around selective licensing is it's one of the key criteria uh that's used in order to be able to bring it in. So um, can anyone give us an answer to that question now, or it may well be something that we have to come back to you on, I think. I, I mean, I can, I'm just looking up the figures on, when you go to the survey on the website, you will um, be able to look at more detailed information um, on ASB. So, over five, over the last five years, I can tell you that 23,865 ASB incidents have been recorded in the private rented sector. Sorry, the second part of your question, Freeman, was that was on, sorry, a housing benefit and universal tenants, claimants and ASB, was it? Sorry, can you just clarify that final bit? Right, uh, if you can hear me, uh, we, he, we, he, was, he was asked, he wrote it down on the whiteboard, how many of those call outs to private rented properties were universal credit tenants or tenants that the count we had taken on on behalf of the council? And yes. he said, I'll tell you, and we have never heard back about that. I, and not, the reason is, let's face it, is because it will probably point towards um, the, the universal credits and possibly council tenants we have taken on are the majority. Well, I can't give you that level of detail. And I think, you know, that that data would be, you know, restricted to DWP, certainly for universal credits. But what we have done through our tenure intelligence modelling is we, we have um, identified the number that specifically rate to the PRS relate to the private rented sector. And, you know, that's a lot of ASB. Um, so certainly there's there's more detail on ASB. If you go onto the online survey, you'll be able to um, see um, a lot of what the modelling's pulled out um, and, you know, the rates per hundred rented properties are very high for, for ASB in, in most of the wards that have been included in those proposals. So sorry, I can't answer your question on on universal credit claimants and ASB. That level of detail is simply not available at this point in time. And I'm, you know, I'd be surprised if many other councils were able to to provide that, as that data is, you know, is pretty restricted for universal credit. Yeah, so we can't just identify people who are on universal no, credit because no, it's indeed. No, I wasn't, asking, I wasn't asking to identify. I was just asking for the percentage. Someone sits down in front of a computer with a month's yeah. worth of ASBs and they say, can you cross reference with this with people on universal credit or council tenants, etc.? What's the percentage of the call outs? I because hear what you're saying. It could be anonymized, couldn't it? Yes, in mm. some way. But it sounds like that's the best we can do, yeah. I think. I mean, ultimately, Freeman, you know, the data is what the data is doing is correlating to the private rented sector and and you know we need your help basically when there are problem tenants um you know with asb and other criminal activities that certainly are prevalent across okay. redbridge you know okay. we okay. were we 
you know. All right, I'll go back to a previous point. So I've got. Now, well, here's all. Let I tell you what, Freeman. Let me just come in here. Um, Peter Swatridge says do a freedom of information request. Right. So that might be the best way to get the data, okay. I think. That's right, what very I would quickly suggest. then, very quickly. So if I have a tenant with uh, with ASB problems and I give him notice to quit, he goes to the council, the council say, wait for the bailiffs. Uh, well, uh, you know well, what that's, I'm saying? <laughs> how, it, how, it's how, a how difficult we... one. If It depends what your um, how your tenancy is set up and who's responsible, but certainly housing options colleagues would be able to assist and you know if it if it is um something that the private sector housing team can help you with please do get in touch with us and we can talk to you offline about it yes we'll leave it there then thanks very much freeman and i thanks, know this me. um this issue has come up a lot really i mean peter swatchy says um you know, re resents the fact that it's suggested that tenants are more likely to be antisocial than owner occupiers. And I think what's happened, Peter, in many ways, just to give some sort of histor uh, historical context here, is that selective licensing of part of discretionary licensing in the 2004 Housing Act was only really intended to be brought in, you know, in a few problem streets in a borough where there was a particular issue around antisocial behaviour. And then it, it was used in 2012 by Newham, by the um, Sir Robin Wales, the mayor of Newham, in audaciously in a borough wide way, really. And I think it, it was a political move, really, to the politicians in Newham, I think, would have argued that it was about trying to raise standards. There might have been an anti landlord dimension to it as well. Um, but the criteria has always been around antisocial behaviour. There are other criteria now, like high levels of migration and so on. So that's why the kind of finger of blame around antisocial behaviour in private sector tenants has been has been raised, really, because essentially it was always one of the fundamental criteria for bringing in a selective licensing scheme. Um, so it's really a, a kind of historical thing that's about um, the original way in which the 2004 Act was was put together. I mean, what I'd like to see, I think, is a kind of a government to take the lead and say, look, do we want all properties to be licensed all across England or don't we? Um, you know, or do we want licensing to just be about a few small problem areas? I think that's the sort of battleground that we're in at the moment. And don't forget that I think it was in the last Queen's speech, or it might have been the one before, where the government suddenly said, oh, actually, we're going to bring in a national register in England, but they haven't really pursued that. And whether the portal will be the way forward for that. But the other thing that they haven't been clear on is whether a register would ever replace licensing. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of confusion policy wise, really, on a national level as to what the purpose of licensing is and whether it should be replaced with some sort of national scheme as it as it has been in Scotland and Wales. Yeah. So I think it, it's going to be a lot of shifting around this in the next few years. It is possible that that councils with licensing schemes would feed or upload data to a portal as well. Um, you know, that is another alternative option that could be available. So just just something to consider there. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Myra asked what do councils do with money collected from the licensing scheme? Now, that's laid down in legislation. The money can only be used for the administration of the scheme and for enforcement of the scheme. And in fact, because of various court cases, local authorities, a lot of local authorities will separate the administration element and the enforcement element. So there's no question that, it, you know, your licensing fee goes towards paying for children's services or or anything else. It can only be used in law or by law for the administration of the scheme. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I hear what you're saying, Fabiola, about it being a huge money making scheme. And it, you know, one of the arguments that landlords and the NRLA has made is that local authorities are very cash strapped. And, you know, that's bad. That's bad for all of us. Uh, and that's, you know, that's just been government policy, really, and austerity, etc. And, you know, in some ways, what local authorities have done is that they funded their private rented sector operation by bringing in licensing schemes and then, you know, the scheme is funded through licensing and, um, you know, lots of landlords feel very 
um, unhappy about that. And, you know, there are 170 pieces of legislation that, that, lo that the government expects local authorities to enforce, and yet it doesn't really give them any money to do that. So land, uh, local authorities in many ways are between a rock and a hard place on this, and um, it's frustrating for all of us, I think. OK, well, look, we've got lots of questions coming through uh, and uh, it's coming up to 10 to 9 now. And um, I can see lots of opinions as well. And what I would remind you to do is to feed those into the consultation, mm -hmm. make your views heard. And remember, you can also get in touch with your local councillor. It's important that councillors hear the views of landlords as well as residents. I think one of the issues is that no one ever goes to the councillor and says, my landlord's marvellous, you know. Um, people go to councillors, to councillor surgeries, to tell them that they've got a problem with their landlord. So it would be good to hear from you as business people in the borough. You know, the private rented sector is a very important funder of local business activity. Talk to your councillors, tell them what you feel about licensing um, and whether you think, feel positively or negatively about it. Definitely. OK, well, I think um, we don't have, seem to have any more questions for me or any more questions for Peter. I think we've aired quite a lot of views on licensing and they've been uh, uh, answered on the whole quite thoroughly. My apologies if they haven't been. And if you don't feel you've had your question answered thoroughly enough, then do uh, email PR, prslicensing at redbridge.gov.uk. Remember, Sorry, it's not Richard, the... it, it's it's the Mel Research um, Redbridge PRS at melresearch.co.uk. Oh, sorry, that's for the consultation. Yeah. My apologies, yeah. Misha. Yes, so and please, the, for please do sign up. Please... Sorry, Richard, please Go do ahead. sign up for that workshop as well, where we can, you know, we can discuss your concerns in more detail and get those recorded and fed in. To the there we go, redbridgeprs at mel, M -E -L research .co uk. Now, we do have another uh, forum meeting coming up. The next one is on Thursday, the 27th of April, 2023, from 7 to 9 p.m. So do get that date in your diary. I think Tonu is still asking how we save the chat, please. No one seems oh. to have answered that. Kataran, are you able to help us with that at all? And John is asking how to access the recording. So all of the slides will be on the recording and that will be available on the Redbridge uh, website. What well, do they just Google Redbridge property licensing, Misha, or how do they Yeah, if you that? go to, I'm just going to put it in the chat, I've just got to find the page. So if you go to housing, um, private rentals and the landlord and tenant forum, you will pick up the links to the videos and it will take us a couple of days and those will be uploaded. Oh, it looks like you can't save the chat because of the version of Teams that we're using. You can copy and paste the text. <laughs> so you might want to frantically do that now, Tony, in Wait. the next few minutes. I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Um, what I also wanted to say is remember that it's your elected councillors that make decisions on whether to go ahead with licensing. Mm. It's not uh, your dedicated local authority officers, so don't give them too hard a time. They do their best, and I think Redbridge uh, do their very best to be as customer focused as they can, to be as helpful as possible, and to be as efficient as they can. I know they had a big back backlog, but they do do their best to, you know, do do things as efficiently as they can. So. You know, please don't be too hard on council officers. Remember, it's your councillors that make the decisions on policy, um, not the, the um, officers. Thank you. OK, well, I think with that, I shall draw the meeting to a close. We had a very good attendance tonight. I think let me see if I can see how many people we have. 196 at one point, so. There you go. Yes. So thank you well, so much, everyone. Thank you for the compliment, Stafford. <laughs> we try our best. Um, yes, it's true that you don't have a council if you don't live in the borough, but you can you can go to your local MP, of course, 
uh, to uh, lobby them on national policy. And I think the point on Section 24 tax arrangements that we are taxed on our turnover, not on our profits, and that's making our businesses all, uh, you know, unprofitable now and is making lots of landlords selling up. Do contact your MP about that. Um, OK, well, thank you so much to all of our presenters this evening. Thanks so much to you, Misha, as well, for, thank you. for your lots of hard work in organising the forum. I hope you found it useful. I'm sorry if we haven't managed to answer absolutely every single point that was raised, but we've done our very best. Um, and what I'll do is wish you a good evening and look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks so much to everyone. Thank you Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. And Take good care. evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night.